Hello everyone, uh, my name is John Harmon. I'm in uh, Jose Andrade's uh, group at Caltech. Um, this product, this is a uh, new uh, project that we've uh, started on, so I'm very excited to be the one to, uh, to share it with you guys. Uh, I've been working on this project along with uh, Mr. Carl Piperis and some previous computational work has been done by Dr. Kawamoto and Vigiani, and then the experimental work has been done by Eddie Ando and Liuchi Liu. Um, the title of the talk is Micro-Inspired Continuum Modeling Using Virtual Experiments, so hopefully uh, um, as the talk continues that becomes, uh, becomes understandable. So I'd like to first start with going over our plan uh, for this project. Uh, first is to do laboratory experiments and uh, use, then use those experiments um, uh, for our computation. So we try to replicate those experiments using uh, our computational uh, tools and then uh, using those uh, computational tools, we then are uh, able to show more interesting experiments than just uh, triaxial tests. And uh, with that, uh, maybe get into some, and then with that, we try to get into constitutive modeling um, using uh, uh, difficult uh, or maybe even impossible experiments um, in, re in real life, but, but possible using our tools. So, uh, but all of this is done at the grain scale for us. Uh, so a lot of the stuff I've seen here is is field level, um, which is uh, of course for earthquakes makes a lot of sense. But uh, there's actually a lot of uh, if you look deep enough into the field level, eventually you will find the grain scale, and there are a lot of uh, interesting uh, phenomena, a lot of uh, um, important things that happen at the grain scale that do eventually influence what does happen at the field scale. And so our goal is to really look at that specifically. And uh, we do this using a tool that we've uh, developed in our lab called, uh, that we call LSDEM. Uh, LSDEM is a DEM variant, but it uses level sets as it, the geometry for every single grain. And the benefit of level sets is that it can capture any shape, it, it, any convexities or concavities. It, it, it doesn't really matter for level sets. We capture all of those, and it can do this in a very inexpensive and parallelizable way. Uh, and what that allows us to do is actually um, simulate um, in full triaxial experiments, like uh, this one, for example, is 54,000 grains, and uh, that's by no mean, means a, a maximum value of grains for us. So uh, the, using LSDM, we've seen very uh, promising results. This is a triaxial test, uh, for example, and uh, by only using uh, material parameters, um, for calibration, such as like uh, inner particle friction or, or grain stiffness, um, we've been able to match the macroscopic uh, pro pro um, macroscopic re response for a triaxial test. And um, as promising as this is, this isn't really the uh, the most exciting part for us. Um, if you actually look deeper, you can see that um, at the mesoscale, uh, it actually ma matches shear strains as well, and it captures the shear band that you see in experiments, um, not even, the, uh, not just the timing or the location, but also the thickness, um, even the, uh, mag even the, uh, the magnitude of, of the shears um, are all captured using LSDM. Um, and, uh, and even if we go one step deeper, we can look at just the individual grain rotations. And again, the timing, the locations, the, the magnitudes, these are all captured using LSDM. And so this is what we really mean by micro-inspired um, when, uh, when we're talking um, about this talk. So uh, with, with triaxial testing uh, being done, we moved one step farther and we looked at cyclic loading. And uh, with no additional cal calibration whatsoever, same, cal same, same material parameters used for the triaxial test, um, we did three um, cycles of loading, and we were actually able to um, capture uh, the cyclic loading uh, macroscopic uh, properties as well. Uh, and um, and uh, moving, and so if we actually look deeper into the cyclic loading, uh, we, and during extension, a very interesting phenomenon happens in cyclic loading, and that is necking. Uh, this is uh, this is um, this is for example, this is the experimental. Uh, pictures of this necking occurring. This is taken by Eddie Ando in, in Grenoble, Grenoble, France, and uh, and you can see the um, 
see how as it extends, it gets thinner in a certain region. And so uh, we, uh, we also visualized um, what's going on in our, computation, in our computational method in LSDEM uh, when we do the exact same um, extension part for the cyclic loading. And we are also able to capture the necking, not, um, not only the timing of the necking um, and the amount of necking, but also the topology of the necking, the location in the specimen where the, uh, where the necking occurs. Um, so, uh, so with this, um, we, uh, uh, we believe that this, this model is, this, that LSDM is an extremely useful tool for actually describing, of actually being predictive in uh, what, what is happening in experiments. And so uh, with that, we want to go into the actual, um, some, some tests that, that do, that look much more closely in uh, constitutive modeling. Um, now this, this idea that, that this program that we're looking into isn't necessarily new. It's called uh, stress probing. And uh, this is an example of someone doing it in classical DEM uh, many, uh, some years ago. Uh, and basically what happens is you make a cubicle specimen, specimen of grains and uh, you take the cubicle specimen and you apply um, stresses on the cubicle specimen in many different directions and every time you apply small increments of stress, you record how much strain of what the increment of strain is, and then you reset the specimen to the original, uh, to the original uh, positions, which um, the, the reason why this is so valuable and for being able to do computationally is you, you cannot reset a uh, specimen in the same way in reality. So, uh, we, and so uh, it's very, uh, very helpful in that sense. Um, and the whole point of, of doing this is to investigate the uh, flow rule in, uh, in uh, constitutive modeling, uh, which uh, usually has to rely on um, a lot of similar experiments, but if we were able to do them uh, computationally, uh, we could, we could um, do things that would, uh, would be very helpful in looking into how this um, flow rule uh, really happens at the grain scale, and, uh, and maybe, even, maybe even more. Um, so. What we did for the stress probing is that we wanted to look specifically at how much shape would affect uh, would, would affect um, the, the stress probing because that's really the big difference between LSDM and classic DM is that we actually look we actually can capture the shape of a particle and so we made two specimens we made one made up of all host and sand grains and then we made another specimen of all spheres so now we can see just how much shape plays an effect. Um, the, uh, the specimens are outside of shape um, extremely similar. They have the same void ratio. They have a very similar amount of, uh, of grains in them. Uh, they're both uh, created the same way, so they're both pluviated uh, virtually. Uh, they are loaded to, um, to a state of 100 kilopascals in every just direction. They're probed at, at that first state of state A. Um, then they're loaded to what we call a state B, where we add um, some deviatoric um, loading, and then uh, they're probed again to state B, and then to look at loading history, uh, we load it to state C, and then then bring it back to state B again. We're going to call that state B prime, uh, and uh, and so uh, and so yeah. So I think um, not too many people have seen what a virtual pollution may look like. So I wanted to show a video example. Of, uh, of what we do. So it's using, using our LSDEM, uh, we just allow the, gra we just um, enter grains into the specimen and, uh, and we allow them to fall just using gravity. So it really is a pluviation just like, um, just like experimenting. So this, is, this isn't the cubicle specimen, this is actually the cylindrical specimen, but the cubicle specimen would be done exactly the same way. You, you, every so many time steps you Enter in a new, um, a new, uh, a new set of grains. You let them fall, and then uh, once you finish all of them falling, you just remove some of the grains off of the top so that you can flatten out your specimen, and then you uh, can apply your confining pressures from there. So here's a little example of what um, of some of our results that we've gotten. This is state B prime. So this is with the loading history. This is the um, the final probing state that we that we do. Um, and uh, what you can immediately see is that there is actually a, quite a significant difference in, um, in what you get um, with adding shape 
uh, to your grains. Uh, it turns out that um, in large part, uh, the plastic strains are much lower when you have uh, more angular grains. And, uh, and uh, what we also see is, mo what to me is most interesting is the bottom graph where we see in, um, stre in the uh, loading angle, the, uh, the, we, uh, we see that actually the isotropic compression and extensions are actually fairly close, but when you get to more deviatoric loadings, so such as the purely deviatoric compression and purely deviatoric extension, or as some people may think of it as zero pressure um, change uh, compression and extension, um, we actually get huge differences. And so we actually looked even farther into this and we split the um, strains into both the volumetric and deviatoric um, components. And uh, while there's certainly um, uh, some deviations in the volumetric, uh, the deviatoric uh, seems to be the driving factor in the deviation between um, volumetric and, uh, but, I mean, the, the driving factor between uh, shaped and uh, uh, spherical uh, grains. And so uh, this is pretty much the preliminary results that we've gotten so far. Um, in the future work, we're going to look, um, uh, we're going to look much more into um, how, what is the reasons for these large changes in, uh, in, uh, in response uh, just due to shape. And uh, what we think that this is really going to come down to is understanding the direction um, of, uh, of the plastic strains uh, and really looking into investigating whether these the plastic strain increment is really going to be um, e exactly uh, perpendicular to the yield surface because uh, we don't think that's um, particularly the case. So uh, um, with that, um, I'd like to thank you guys for your attention and your time. Um, Does the shape follow any statistical distribution? Maybe you said it, but I missed it. So mm. when you define this shape, right? So what kind of variability involved. In right. So what we do to get the shapes is uh, we take the, uh, the the specimen of host and sand, and we X-ray the sand, and uh, and taking that X-ray, we then do our um, our level set characterization, and we match every single grain one to one. From the uh, from from the uh, uh, from the pick from the X-rays to um, uh, to the virtual space, right? And uh, for the stress probing, um, all all that I did is that I just took all of those grains and uh, I just I just put them all in the uh, the stress the the specimen. I just pluviated them, so it should be the same. Whatever. Um, Whatever it is was for whatever we had for the triaxial and the cyclic loading, it should have the exact same grain size distribution, um, sphericity, angularity, um, whatever other pro um, like statistical properties you, you may be looking for. Um, and this, this specifically, the numbers for all those should be found in in our uh, uh, um, initial papers on the triaxial of the on the triaxial test. Because spheres and real sands have different Emaxes and Emins, shouldn't you be looking at relative density and not comparing void ratio? Mm. Um, yeah, so... Uh, uh, right, so uh, uh, possibly, and that's something that, that we may look into. Um, like I said, this is, this, is a, this is a new project and sort of trying to compare between grains and spheres is something that, you know, we're trying to look at it in many different ways. So uh, I think, uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's quite possible that that could be um, a better way of comparing it. So uh, we'll certainly look into that. Are there any other questions? Um, off top, a little off topic, but for the parallelization, how, what machine did you use and how well did it scale up? So um, for uh, parallelization, um, uh, what machine we use? We use uh, we used to use Comet, but now we use one in Caltech, a cluster at Caltech, of HPC cluster. Um, it uh, it it's it scales um, it scales very well um, on uh, uh, it scales very well up to a certain point. So basically, you you uh, separate all of the all of the contact checking um, in for the grains into different processors, right? So every processor has its own. Has its own set of grains that it contact checks, and so uh, it it 
it's very parallelizable up to a certain point. And then, so but usually we, we, uh, we run it on like 640 processors for the 54,000 grains and you split it up like that. And um, it, uh, it, if at that point, it's pretty much as, as parallel as, as you would hope it to be. Like you don't see very much um, uh, loss. Maybe we should talk better. Sure. Uh, go ahead. How expensive is the contact search algorithm for the LS, DM versus spheres? It's it's really um, it's 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 just it's just as expensive, if not even um, if not possibly even easier, just because uh, L the the beauty of level sets is that the level sets store exactly how far away the surface that what level sets do is they store exactly how far away the surface is at all points of the grain. So whenever you um, whenever one grain asks another grain. Uh, how if I'm overlapping? How much am I am I overlapping? This is right how how DEM gets its its contact right. The the grain immediately knows that information because that's how the grain is defined by. Let's so uh, I guess if the grain is a regular shape, you have to how do you deal with the rotation of the particles? How do how do we deal with the rotation of the? Right. Well, it's a, if it, for circles, it'd be pretty easy yeah. to see if they're in contact. Sure. But when you got if the particles are a regular shape. Mm -hmm. And they're spinning around. How do you get the all about that? How do we just um, so we just use we just use quaternions and we save the quaternion and uh, we allow uh, so uh, it's it's uh, we just we just rotate the the, the points of the grain. Um, so that's that's uh, yeah that's that's all it is. Okay.